at Newcastle Art Centre, which is going to be our festival hub uh, for this week. So we have workshops happening here, the performance workshops just down the road, and we also have Alison's workshop, which is happening uh, upstairs. And welcome to one of the... Well, we've had lots of events so far, but uh, one of the first events for this week in this venue, uh, which is a Q&A uh, with the wonderful Alison Duddle. So please join me in welcoming oh. her. <laughs> if that's all I have to do to get a clap, then that's fantastic. <laughs> that's brilliant. So the nature of these uh, events is um, I'll use my opportunity here to ask you a few questions mm -hmm. um, just to get some uh, context about um, Alison, your life in puppetry, maybe that's what we should call it. And um, also I'm really interested in your uh, approach to making as well. And since you're doing the making course here, uh, I'll ask you a little bit about that. And then we open it up for questions. So uh, as, as we're talking, please be thinking of uh, some nice questions for Alison. Uh, so it's not just me uh, all the way through. And we're going to go uh, all the way through uh, till 7pm. Uh, um, and then because and then we have to sort of promptly be out if you're not seeing the show later. Um, yes, anyway, so welcome Alison. Hello. And I wondered if we could start by uh, you d describing your life in puppetry and sort of how you got started in puppetry. Was it a childhood thing? Was it something you got into later? And uh, sort of how you got to where you are today? Yes, I will say that before I, before I start speaking, I'll just say I know I have quite a quiet voice. So if anybody's come in later and they want to come just a little bit closer, do feel free, there's some spots down here. Um, but my journey in puppetry, I wasn't particularly interested in puppets as a child. I wasn't one of those people who just love, you know, uh, uh, having little hand puppets or making things that way. I was, as a lot of people are, obsessed with fairies at some point in my childhood. And I think the idea of having very small people that lived somewhere in my bedroom that I would get little bottles of milk delivered for, all of that, that whole miniature world was massively exciting to my imagination. And so I'm sure that that is, some, that somehow that feeds into, into making little worlds of puppetry. Um, but I didn't actually get involved in, I always loved making art at school, and I didn't get involved in making puppets until after, so I went to university, did something completely different, and started doing a master's in something completely different, and decided I'm not at all interested in this. I don't know why I've gone down this route. What was it? It was medieval languages. <laughs> um, and so I started this MA in medieval studies and thought, I don't, I don't know how this happened. I just want to make things. I, I, I don't want to become the person that's teaching me right now because that was the only possible route I could think of. And I thought, I just love making things with my hands. And I just wanted to get back into the world of artwork. I didn't know much about puppetry. And I started to... I rented a flat in London from a lovely guy who was an artist. And he was making a show based on some poems by Ted Hughes. And I said, do you know what? Can I just come and, can I just come and help you? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So I didn't make puppets with him. But I did make costumes and did some admin and took some photographs and I loved it. And then um, moved away and carried on doing art making with children. And then I came across a puppet theatre when I was living in Minnesota in the United States called In the Heart of the Beast Puppet and Mask Theatre. And it, it changed my life, Matt. It was just like, oh! It was going to see a show and watching the show and thinking, the way that I feel right now watching this show is the way, that's what I want to learn, is how to make people feel that way. Because what I felt is that although it was a show that was for adults and children together, I felt completely like I could enter it as a child, that I could enter with my imagination wide open, I could be carried along by the magic and the storytelling, and I absolutely loved that. And so I called them up and said, I'd just come and volunteer. Is that all right? 
and they were totally lovely. And uh, yeah, I went and I volunteered and I learned stuff and then they gave me bits of work and I carried on being involved with that. And then I moved back to the UK and I thought, oh, I only know one puppet organisation, <laughs> but I know there are puppet organisations in the UK. And which and one I, was it? So the, the one that I knew was uh, the one in Minneapolis, but when I came back to the UK, I was living in Manchester. Uh -huh. And so a friend of mine knew Bob, who was at Horse and Bamboo, and so I called up and said, I've just moved into the area, do you have any, you know, I'd love to come and chat to you about what's going on. And I went there, started just as a maker on one project, and I stayed there for 17 years and was very involved there with making shows and directing Puppet Festival, which is how I know a lot of people who are here. And, um, yeah, making puppets, making shows, that kind of thing. And I did that for 17 years, and then, since then, I've been a freelance maker and director and I have my own little company called the Bird in the Hand Theatre which mostly does outdoor work uh, for families but I work as a freelance maker for lots of different organisations so that's kind of my journey into puppetry and it was quite flattering that on the description it said I'd been making puppets for 18 years because it's actually it's quite a bit longer than that. <laughs> I'm quite a lot older than that. <laughs> it sounds like a big number, but really the real number is much, much higher than that. Right. So yeah, that's my that's my journey. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And the the nature of your freelance work, are you is that making, is that workshops, is that uh, building shows for other people? How does that Well it's kind of look? it's a complete mixture as it is for most freelancers. So I would say I'm first and foremost a maker um, and uh, and then through making and wanting to create pictures I came to directing work. But most of the freelance work that I do ends up being making a child or an animal for a show. It's it's how most it's how most of us are. A regular theatre show will go, oh shit, we need a dog in <laughs> Oh oh no, we need a dog in this show. Um, and so you get a call or oh, we need a child in this show, so you get a call. Which is great and it's lovely to make things. It's really lovely to be able to connect with lots of different organisations and different directors and different performers, many of whom have never come into contact with puppetry before so that's really fun um, but the thing that's much harder is to start work from scratch uh -huh. so that's uh -huh. the thing that is kind of the uh -huh. hard balance I think as a freelancer uh -huh. is creating brand new work especially for indoors it's yeah. much easier for outdoors I think for indoors it's a little bit harder how so it's just that relationship between venues and freelancers and uh -huh. you know uh -huh. to, in order to get a theatre piece off the ground. Things are in your own hands, maybe yeah. in an outdoor space a bit yeah. more than... Yes, and how does your own work fit in with commission for other people? Do you find sort of space for your own...? Um, yeah, it's, it's always interesting. It's always kind of like just when you think you've got a bit of time... So at the beginning of this year, I had a, an idea for a show that I really wanted to make and I talked to a couple of my former friends about it and it's like, yeah, yeah, we're totally going to make this show. And then I got some work. <laughs> and because you don't have funding for the making your own show part, um, yeah. the getting the bits of work always have to um, take over and the other bit just goes on the side and you go, yeah, oh, oh, we'll get back to that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so... But it's, that's why it's lovely to be at something like a puppet festival and see scratch shows and cabaret shows and then fully formed shows and it really inspires you to go, yeah, I want to make another show. <laughs> so keen to get uh, to all of your questions uh, in just a moment. But first, I'd love to ask, because you're doing the making course here mm -hmm. at um, Moving Parts, the six day making course, and I am very struck but in your making practice by the diversity of materials that you mm -hmm. use. And I wondered if you could just speak to that and how, how you maybe choose different materials or different modalities for, yeah. for different puppets. So, I, yes, it's interesting you say uh, that I use a range, big range of materials because I actually feel like I use the same mm. materials and techniques over and over again and expand it only if I need to for a particular project. 
So um, almost all of the puppets that I make um, for theatre or for you know the, the, this kind of work is I use two main materials. I use I sculpt with clay and then do papier mache over the top. So these heads are all made in that method. So they're a uh, big clay sculpt and then I cover it in cling film and then mm. five layers of really strong brown paper. And if we look at this one, we can... So this is this is the... This is a mask that I made. Um, so it's hollow. It's a full head mask that could be performed in if it was padded, might be painted. But this is one I brought just to show the group Mm -hmm. what the process would be if it's not painted and if it's not scrimmed so they could just see the material. Uh -huh. um, so this is a clay mould, you've, you've papier mache over, yeah. and then do you scoop yeah, out? Yeah, and then I or? slice it mm -hmm. down the back, pull the paper off and then join it back together so it's really light yeah. and it's really strong uh -huh. and it's just paper. So it's cheap. It's super cheap. It, if it, biode you know, it's going to biodegrade, it's great. And, and the clay layers? gets reused over and over and over again. There's no limit on how many times I can use the clay, so I can rehydrate it. Mm. It's you know, it's great. And how many layers? About five. Five layers. And yeah. the clay. What clay do you use? Just regular ceramic clay. I just yeah, just buy it from Stoke on Trent. But once you've got it, actually, you can just use it forever. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, yeah, I've had the same clay, well, since becoming freelance, I've had the same lot of clay, and I reuse it over and over. So each puppet that I make has got, you know, material memory of all the puppets that I've made in it. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And then the other material that I like to use is wood, um, and that, uh, I always use lime wood. I don't tend to use gelatin, although a lot of people like to. And I tend to only use that for things that are smaller, than, um, you know, obviously you lose a little bit of detail with the papier-mâché, so if I'm making a very small head or things that need to be strong, like legs or arms, um, mm -hmm. then I'll carve. Um, so this is a little puppet head that I made, uh, but all of the hands and feet of the other puppets are carved ones. Um, yeah, so we'll be using both of those techniques in the, mm -hmm. in the course, and they'll be learning to make a puppet that's um, kind of based on the proportions of this one. So they'll be learning, um, you know, basic carving and then mm -hmm. joint making, uh, ankle and knee joints, and carving hands um, and rigging the puppet, and then papier mache body and head. So it's assembling those two things and kind of like hopefully on the last day also maybe making a little bit of costuming and bringing it to life. Um, so those are the two main materials I use. I have in the last few years increasingly been pa making lantern puppets as well, mostly for a zoo commission that I've had for a few years. And then I've been using warbler quite a bit, which is... Miracle The miracle that everybody loves. <laughs> but, but I just don't ever use it as a structural material. I only okay. use it as a lantern material and because it's waterproof. Mm -hmm. So it's a material that I use quite sparingly because it's a expensive and b although it is not as bad as a lot of other plastics it is a plastic mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know i live in yorkshire and it rains all the time yeah. so if you want to make something that has to be outside for a really long time then yes. it's important to think about longevity and that kind of thing and you say with the lantern because obviously it can let light through so it can it's translucent so yeah. it's really it takes light really beautifully and i actually have discovered a way of dyeing it uh, so that I can get really beautiful, intense colours. Oh, wow. um, so in some of the animals that I've made, I've been able to get really lovely, um, you know, translucent uh, mm -hmm. colour. Whereas if you painted it, it it's going to block the light just mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you may see it a little bit more yeah, 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 than yeah, a dye. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks yeah. so much. Uh, I think there's... I've, I've, used enough of the time asking my question so I would love to open it up to the floor uh, if you do have a question please do uh, raise your hand and uh, ask away a question at the back there it's called warbler uh, w-o-r-b-l-a 
Um, and it's a material a lot of people are using for lots of different things, and they do a, a variety of, it comes in a variety of colors and finishes, so you can get some that's more structural. Um, but the, but the, the main one, Warbler Finest Art, it's not cheap, but it's beautiful brown color, and uh, yeah, you can, it gives a really, in some ways it feels a little like leather, you know, in that it's kind of got some stiffness to it. It has a slight grain, and um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it gives beautiful light. I know a lot of other puppeteers in the room use it in different ways, so they might use it more for making solid puppet heads, but I would still tend to always use paper for something that's not translucent, just because that's my preference. And I feel I can get a better finish with paper than I can with warbler. But it's really great material to know about. No, it's a thermoplastic. So the way that I would work with it is exactly the same way I'd work with paper. So I'd make a clay sculpt first. And then you can either pattern it or just work straight from a sheet. And you heat it with a heat gun. And then it just, just melts, just becomes soft. And while it's soft, you can really work it. And you can get it into all of the different areas of your sculpt and then once it cools it stays like that of course the disadvantage is if you live in a hot place and you put it in your car and uh, it'll melt you know it melts it keeps remelting at exactly the same temperature it melted to start with we don't have that problem so much in this country but um but it yeah i mean i've mostly used it for things that happen in winter so it, it's felt it, it hasn't melted <laughs> so far. And just quickly, that dye you were talking about, are you, have, can you share? Yeah, yeah. I've been using, um, I've been experimenting with using um, eye dye poly or other um, dyes that are for synthetic fabrics. So if you dye it in a regular cotton dye, it won't work. But if you put it in a synthetic dye, it does mean that you have to heat, you have to dye it on a rolling boil. So... My kitchen is like a little bit mad at this moment because I have a big pan of, of dye cooking with, you know, some really intense colour. And then you have to put the warbler pieces in and of course then they go completely floppy. So you just have to find a way of dyeing them and getting them out and then cooling them so that you can then reuse them. But you can get beautiful colours. Yeah, Wonderful. really nice. If anybody wants to see photos of that, I've got some on my phone I can show you. Come and ask me later. Uh, with an indoor piece, you don't have to be concerned about weather or, or anything, yep. but you said that it's more difficult to uh, create a piece for indoors, whereas yeah. if it's indoors, it's entirely uh, in your control, yeah. and depending on the theatre, but obviously you need lights and sound, so why, why do you say it's more difficult making a piece indoors as opposed to outdoors? Um, financially, is, is all. Oh, okay. Um, that it's just, I think... Um, I, I just think it's a harder, harder process. Um, the selling of selling shows is much harder. I found selling shows outdoors much easier. And people are much more responsive and actually get in touch with me, whereas trying to book an indoor show feels like oh, can feel a bit difficult. Um, and also. Yeah, just the commitment that a venue has to put into developing a piece. It's a little bit harder to convince them of that than a piece that just goes out really easily. Can so, you speak to some of that outside work that you've made? Yeah. You've got some really lovely so, pieces. Um, yeah, today actually, I had a piece that was out in Durham, which is not very far away from here. Um, and it's a cycle-powered carousel that I made... Oh, about five, five or six years ago. Um, and when I'd started carving wood, I thought, you know, I'd really love to make something bigger in wood. Um, and so I decided to work with a, a friend of mine who's a really fantastic kinetic sculptor. And he made the metal work, and so the base and the bicycle mechanism. And I carved 10 uh, animals that are that children can ride. So it's a, a piece that's for very young children. And um, yeah, it's really sweet and it keeps going. <laughs>
people it, are interested in it. And it has lots of puppets and things as well, that, uh, some of which Mark Parrot made over here. Some lovely, beautiful butterflies. Um, and, uh, yep, so there's that. And we have some uh, swallows, some kite puppets that I made, some silk kite puppets that tour around a lot. And then there's a little show on a bicycle that also Mark performed for a while called Special Delivery that's a, a goofy kind of show about a postman. Uh, but a lot of the work that I like to make doesn't have language as part of it. It's more visual images, so uh, that works really well in an outdoor setting or it can work really well in an outdoor setting. Um, but theatres in this country, I think, are afraid of work without words. <laughs> That's my perception. <laughs> Which maybe speaks to the idea of actually it being easier to for you mm -hmm. to to make work in that space because it yeah. matches what you're. And yeah. yes, if people haven't seen the wonderful. Uh, what, the bewonderment machine. The bewonderment called. machine. Yeah. Just a little is, goofy compound word that I'm. Yeah. It's oh. gorgeous and with all the bark on it as well. And then little shows that, that as you come round, mm -hmm. so do look it up yeah, um, if you're interested. So, any other questions for the time that we have left together? Yeah. I was wondering, so, uh, um, uh, the, so uh, the Bible Project and the That's okay. So what's the balance? And also yeah. kind of, um, in either of those cases, do the designs of the puppets and such come first, or are they sort of based on what prompt you're giving, I suppose, um, um, how that makes sense? I, yeah, I very rarely work from an external design from somebody else. I think people who ask me to make things kind of kind of know the style of thing that I make and so yeah I, I don't often work from somebody else's design but you know sometimes you modify things a bit to be more in the style of a show or to work within the the, the set designers brief um, um, I would say 80% oh, of the work that I do is other people work for other people maybe even 90. Uh, and then of the bit that's my work, most of it is stuff that's existing that's going out and it's very hard to find that, uh, you know, 5% of like making brand new things for, uh, from scratch. Uh, but hopefully this, hopefully this year, maybe next year, maybe the year after, I'll, I'll shift that balance. But it's just because, partly because it's also really exciting to be asked. You know, it goes without saying that when somebody calls you up and says, you know, I made some masks for a film last year and it was really brilliant and, you know, they were just this tiny part of a film. It didn't matter. It was really lovely to be asked and really lovely to work with that designer and, you know, on those things. And that's great. And then, uh, you know, at the moment I'm making some sculptural pieces. I'm make, working, making some willow sculptural pieces. For a project at the RSC, an, out, uh, an outreach project to the RSC, which is just really exciting. It's it's kind of my work because I'm designing it, I'm creating it, but it's not my project, so it's not a piece that I can then tour. But it's all lovely, isn't it? It's like, what's not to like about making stuff? <laughs> You can hardly whinge. <laughs> and how, how does workshops fit in with that creative practice as well? Because you get asked to do that. Uh, do you know, I don't... No, I haven't done very many workshops. Okay. I, I've been doing a little bit of teaching recently for Man at Manchester Met. I've been working with uh, illustration students, which is really nice, because a lot of them are really interested in puppetry. Um, yeah, when somebody asks me. Really? <laughs> Thank you for work, asking um, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you. No, I do. So I do have a couple more questions um, before we wrap up. But do catch my eye if you have some questions. Oh, I have a. Did you say there was a question? With that? Yeah. Please go ahead. It's 
not a silly question. Well, it's a good question. <laughs> So the, the process, I would say one thing is if you want to see more about the process and if you happen to be free any day this week, bob into where we're running the workshop, uh, which is just around the corner there. And I can show you the process, you know, hands on, but, uh, which is uh, always a nicer way of doing it. But in short, um, start with a big chunk of clay, usually on something like a paint can. Bash it a bit, sculpt it a bit, play with it a little bit, cover it in cling film which is a barrier layer between the um, clay and the paper. Cover it in about five layers of heavy brown paper and I use wallpaper paste. Because my most beloved wallpaper paste is no longer being made, I have to use a different one and so I now put PVA glue in because I don't trust it. Anything like the same way I used to <laughs> trust my other. Um, and so it's wallpaper paste with a little bit of PVA and then once it's dry, I really burnish it. So that's just like I rub the heck out of it with a smooth, with a bone file is what I usually use, but you can use a spoon, whatever you like. And then I cut it off. So um, with this one, I probably would have put a Stanley knife, sorry, mate, straight in the head here and bring it to the back of the sculpture. Paper has quite a lot of give to it. so. It, if you cut it all the way off, it's hard to realign it, but you don't necessarily have to cut the face part. So if you can cut a little bit under here sometimes, and here you can pull it off. And because it's paper, you can just join it back together. So you just maybe put a couple of staples in and you just repaper it and it's strong. So it's very simple, very low tech method. And it's the same method I learned when I was, you know, 22 uh, in the heart of the beast and <laughs> really wanting to learn how to make puppets and it, I still do it the same way. So, yeah. Yes. I wait until it's fully dry. No, I wait until it's dry. Um, and at least until the t top couple of layers are dry and then you can really give it a good... It depends where you are. I think here, maybe two days in my workshop in West Yorkshire in the winter, two weeks. <laughs> if I didn't do anything to try and speed it up. I have to carry things home and put them by the fire because then yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do well in the damp. <laughs> and that is the way to dry it, is it? Just putting it somewhere warm and- Yeah, just yeah. somewhere warm and ideally with the air moving a little bit, but uh -huh. you know. You don't want to like dry it out with a fan heater because then the top layer dries and it doesn't dry so well underneath and it shrinks weirdly but um yeah okay. sunshine definitely the best way to dry it <laughs> out in the sun. so my final question was just because you mentioned wood and mm -hmm. i think for maybe uh, beginners or not even beginners but it can be quite an uh, intimidating material um at mm -hmm. first and i kind of wondered if you had any tips for someone who was kind of looking into getting into yeah, wood? Yeah, I would say take a class uh -huh. and I, the, the, one of the only classes I've ever taken in my life was I took John Roberts carving course where uh -huh. most puppeteers I know have taken at some point in their journey. He's great, he's a really good teacher, he's really good at t showing you about tools and I understood more about wood from doing that course than I ever had in my experimenting before. Mm -hmm. So that's great, great introduction. And then play. Um, it's expensive, it has to be said, you know, buying, I only buy lime, I don't ever use gelatin. And what's the difference between the two? Um, lime comes from this country mm -hmm. and it's, uh, you know, I get it from a tree surgeon, so it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's a tree that was already meant to be cut down, it was already being cut down, so yeah. it's fine. Uh, gelatin, carved so easily that people love to use it but it's an endangered hardwood so I choose not to. Okay. I think there are places that it's grown that are a little more uh -huh. sustainable but still uh, I prefer not to use it. Uh -huh. um, but lime works really well, it's a really nice um, material and um, yeah, get a good chisel, uh. keep it sharp. Make sure you don't slice too much of your body off. <laughs> but I'd say, yeah, just get a, uh, do, I'd say do an introduction course 
and then that, that's definitely, it will save you loads of time and money. And I think that's the thing, there are some specific things that yeah. you do need to learn and sort well, of type of word as well as you mentioned. Yeah, so the, the joints that I'm going to be teaching on this course this week, I totally learned from John Roberts. You know, yeah. that's how we all, we all, as puppeteers, we learn a lot of stuff just from making it up by ourselves and fiddling in the workshop, but I learn from working with, alongside other people who are really good at making things. So work with Mark a lot and doing that course with John Roberts and other people I've worked alongside. I'll kind of learn how to make a particular joint and go, oh, brilliant. That's, you know, now I can do that all the time if I practice a lot and a lot. And yeah, if you, that's, that's how you develop your own skills and your own repertoire. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Thank you to Alison.